The last 20 years has seen substantial growth in RRVs, the acronym used for the construction site plant that has been adapted to run on both roads and railways. Most rail infrastructure work now involves some form of RRV plant. Until more recent times, and as this case history reveals, what hadn't been realised by users was how prone some of these vehicles were to poor adhesion conditions. In December 2007, an excavator RRV was sent to work a long gradient in the Scottish Highlands. The machine was there to assist with works in Glengarry, where the railway climbs towards the summit on a gradient of 1 in 75. The work included rock face stabilisation and drainage works. The RRV brought materials to the site from the access point near the summit and was towing a trailer. The weather was very wet and in between the access point and the site there was another work site in operation. Vegetation was being cleared from the line side. This involved dragging trees across the line and feeding them into a chipper standing on the other line. This work probably caused some contamination of the railhead but the driver of the RRV as he passed by wasn't aware of this. As the RRV approached the slope stabilisation site, the driver started to brake, but the machine didn't slow down. He fully applied the brakes, but the machine still continued towards the work site where his colleagues were working and using another RRV. The driver frantically blew the horn and flashed the lights to warn the staff. However, because of the noise from their machine, and correctly wearing ear defenders, they didn't hear the horn. In turn, their view of the approaching and uncontrollable RRV was obstructed by the other RRV drilling the rock face. It was an abseiler working on the slope who saw the approaching runaway. He was able to attract the attention of the other workers who quickly moved out of the way. The drill was withdrawn just as the runaway train reached the site and the drill machine slewed out of the way. There wasn't time to get it completely clear and a minor collision ensued before the runaway eventually came to a standstill further down the slope. The RAIB inspector deployed to the site carried out interviews of witnesses and impounded the RRV. An old railway yard near Glasgow initially provided a location to measure the effectiveness of the brakes. This was done on the level and showed that the brakes could stop the machine in the dry, but in the wet were much less effective. So further tests were arranged on a comparable slope at the Bowness and Keneal Heritage Railway. As rail contamination was also suspected to be a factor, paper tape was used to simulate leaves having fallen on the track, a standard practice for train braking tests. Water was then poured on the wheels to simulate the heavy rain at the time of the incident. The result of this test was very disturbing for all who witnessed it. The RRV was simply unable to stop, sliding uncontrollably down the gradient. It was also found the RRV couldn't hold the trailer on the slope when stationary. The RAIB recommended that trailers without service brakes should never be used on gradients, and without exception, Network Rail now requires all trailers to be fitted with service brakes. However, there were further runaway incidents involving poor RRV brakes and Network Rail has since funded the fitting of rail wheel brakes to this type of RRV across the whole fleet. High-ride RRVs without rail wheel brakes were subsequently banned from the network. Our second runaway happened in tunnels on London Underground's Northern Line shortly before 7 o'clock on a Friday morning. A train used for maintaining the track had broken down in a tunnel and an empty tube train had been sent to the rescue. The two trains were coupled together using an emergency coupler and the tube train began pulling the maintenance train uphill. Just after passing Highgate Station, the tube train braked, the coupling broke and the maintenance train began running backwards down the hill. As it ran through Highgate Station, two people managed to jump off. Staff were unable to stop the 39-tonne maintenance train and it ran through seven stations, reaching speeds of up to 35 miles per hour. The runaway continued to roll uncontrollably until it entered an area where passenger services were operating. Fortunately, the engineering train was going in the same direction as scheduled passenger trains. Quick-thinking control room staff were able to prevent a collision by instructing passenger train drivers to keep moving and not stop at any station. 
The train finally came to a standstill at Warren Street Station, about four miles south of Highgate. The RAIB investigation initially focused on two questions. Why did the emergency coupler break? And why didn't the maintenance train come to a stop as soon as this happened? This sort of failure shouldn't ordinarily be high risk, because if couplers break, normally a backup system kicks in to prevent an accident. This is usually a device that automatically applies the brakes to all parts of the train, or is prevented by the addition of a supplementary coupler. As Principal Inspector Chris Ford explains. Usually, if a coupling breaks, either the train will come to an automatic stand or there will be an emergency coupler or a chain which keeps everything together. On this occasion the brake didn't work um, and that's because the brake depended on the engine on the grinding unit keeping running. The engine had broken so the brakes had been released by winding a screw underneath the train and in that condition the brakes could never operate. Testing was commissioned to help understand why the coupler broke. It should have acted as a rigid bar, but the test showed that a joint along the coupler allowed it to flex. This is the coupler as we recovered it from sight. This end was connected to the tube train. The further end was connected to the grinding unit. In between, there's a pin that's used to join the two parts of the coupler together. During the accident, what happened was that the coupler moved relative to the pin, like that. This piece followed it until the coupler broke here. It broke here, and we can show that it broke here, because this piece of metal is bent tight here. This piece of metal has clearly been pulled away here. So that gives us the direction of the components when the break occurred. Very simply, RAIB's investigations, supported by witness interviews, showed that the joint of the emergency coupler had been designed for the forces expected in a rigid coupler, but not the forces that develop when it flexes. Because the RAIB aims to make recommendations which will prevent future accidents, inspectors were interested in more than just the technical causes of this particular event. They looked at the design of the train, checking and testing the approved process for the emergency coupler and the instructions for using it. Inspectors found that procedures for these activities were ineffective, making no mention of the need for a backup system when the brakes were fixed in an off position. The grinding unit was carrying some instructions about how to use the coupler, but although the instructions told you how to fix the coupler on to both trains, it didn't tell you that you needed to take some sort of backup process for example, a set of chains to deal with the possibility that the coupler could break. Key elements of the emergency coupler design had been carried out by someone who lacked the necessary expertise. Finally, shortcomings were found in the testing carried out before the coupler entered service and shortly before the Highgate runaway when an earlier incident provided clues that the emergency coupler was unsatisfactory. The recommendations from RAIB's investigation were targeted at providing effective procedures and checking that other engineering equipment is not affected by the shortcomings which caused the runaway. London Underground has since introduced revised procedures to help prevent a similar incident.